Hey guys, I am Joe Zija, and you're watching the Points of Experience Podcast. As you heard, we've got Joe Zija coming on the show today. Um, somebody who I've seen from afar. We've been connected through various projects, obviously Genshin Impact and uh, Persona 3. Um, but somebody I've really admired, see, like to see all of the things that he does as an artist through his musical endeavors, um, through his YouTube channel, his Twitch streaming, um, his tremendous success in the voice acting industry, um, not only through video games. Obviously, Fire Emblem was tremendously um successful and his work as claude is really uh i think spoke volumes to his capacity as an actor um but he has a, a background that is not your traditional story it's not the i went to i was obsessed with theater i went to theater school i got an agent and blah 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 he really had to figure out through his journey in life and a, a large part of that being the military to finding it, uh, you know, down the line, what his career was going to be and um, creating various parts of his entrepreneurial life now um, through voice acting. He has an academy that we talk about um, that the link is in the description here. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, which I cannot recommend more um, of how to become successful as a voice actor, uh, as a contemporary, um, seeing things through this perspective of people like me and people like him and how to become successful today, the industry is not the same as what it was. So I cannot recommend that enough. We talk all about that. Um, and just a lot of stuff that interests him and in how he's navigated this industry and found success and how it wasn't overnight like we all kind of think it is uh so if you're interested in that stuff make sure you stick around for this episode but before we get there make sure you like and subscribe to the channel check out the patreon patreon.com slash pox podcast um also available on spotify if you subscribe there's gonna be exclusive episodes uh behind the scenes and access to the discord things we are doing exclusively to the people who support us and allow us to keep making this wonderful program that i hope you guys are benefiting from um but without further ado we've got the wonderful the one and only and a fellow Garden State person, Jerseyan, Jerseyite, whatever they call them, Joe Zija on the Points of Experience podcast. Hey, what's going on, Joe? Thank you so much for joining us today. I am beyond excited to chat with you for so many reasons. We'll get into that. But um, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm excellent, Paul. It's great to, to meet you. I think this is our first time we've ever actually spoken face to face. Yeah, it's good to meet you. I'm, I'm glad. I've, Thanks for reaching out. Oh, no, my pleasure. Honestly, it's crazy because this industry happens all the time here on the show. There's someone you've worked with on a project and everyone just assumes like, oh, yeah, you know, so and so or you've oh, met man. this. It's like, no, no yeah. 90, 99 percent of the people we've never met before. Um, but for you, you know, you're someone who I've definitely seen. I've known about uh, you, you've done some amazing work in this industry, nice. definitely with all the streaming that you've done now that you're in Genshin Impact. A lot of people are, are from that I know from my community have been like, you got to go mm -hmm. watch Joe's stream. So I definitely pop in from time to time Sweet. and uh, it's been so great. And honestly, just to kind of jump forward and we'll jump back in a second. Um, your stuff is Risley because it's Genshin's one of the games I've been playing through and I've been experiencing the story. He's been one of my favorite characters in the story and everything with his uh, specific story quest and in the Archon quest. The character is such a unique piece within the Genshin universe that has so many main characters. I'm noticing that as we go, yeah. I'm not super familiar with Genshin other than what I've played so far. So yeah, I'm, I'm noticing that he's a little unique. He he is, and it's it's so it's a, it's a gut, such a fresh take, and I think a lot of it has to do with your performance, and obviously it has to do with his character. But there's such a realness and a groundedness to this seemingly like you don't know, especially in the beginning, and you would know from recording mm -hmm. it. You know, you don't really know how to where to put, to put him. He's the head yeah. of this kind of jail system, or he, you know, yeah. and you, you think he's a bad guy, and then with my character specifically, I'm like, yo, this dude's about to let my character die, and some primordial seawater yes. what's yep, going yep, on yep. um so you don't really know where to put your finger and you do such a fantastic job of straddling that line of having um your point of view as your character and the things that you want and you need and your opinions on justice and especially to contrast the nervulet character you really do a great job of of being kind of this um partial and at times impartial voice yeah, in this game that often has very clear indications of who this character is from almost a stereotypical perspective yeah 
Yeah, it's been beautiful. How, was was that something that you just to start here, and we'll jump back in a second? But when when you got that character, was that something that you either strategized yourself with, or um, you talked with with the team, or you just kind of made that choice to be like each? It's a moment by moment situation for this character, and I, I have to just play the moment as it is. Yeah. So it was really interesting because, like as you know, when you get the audition, you have no idea what you're auditioning for. It's just you know some random guy. They give you a, a background. I think they might have mentioned that he was either a guard, a prison guard, or a warden, or something like that. And uh, but usually, like when, when, like when I teach, I say like the first thing I'm looking at is the script, not the specs. So I'm looking at the words he's saying and what they look like. And um, you know, I spent some time. I've, most of my adult life was actually in the military. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a rank that happens between enlisted and officer called a warrant officer. And these guys tend to be um, technically proficient, but grumpy, a little lazy, uh, and not big on rules. And so when I was looking through his stuff, especially there was an audition line about filing reports. Right. That the first line was about like, oh, yeah, you can send this report up. And then I was like, why don't we take these last two pages of the report out and then you can send the rest. It was that kind of like, let's yeah. make this, you know, look a little different. <laughs> um, and so I took inspiration from like the warrant officers I knew during my time in the military and kind of applied it to Risley. Now, fast forward to the session. The first thing we did wasn't his story stuff. Well, mm. I, let me backpedal. The first thing we did was the cinematics, right? Yeah. We, we needed to go straight into um, dubbing the, the cutscenes, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first cutscene I do as Risley is the one where he basically says, I'm God and I can get away with murder, right? Like that he says, you know, if the Duke wants somebody dead, he needs no justification, which is like, that sets a tone, right? Yeah. Like that's, that sends a certain message about a character and it was my first impression of him. So mm. not knowing anything else, because you know, you don't get the script until the, the day before or during the session, yeah. you know, like not knowing anything else, I'm like, oh, okay, this guy's kind of a, a badass. Um, and then as we got out of the cutscenes and into the script, I remember having to make a pretty steep adjustment because his language is quite formal. Yeah. And, you know, he like, uses words like rather, however, like the things that like, you know, your average prison thug is not tossing around. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how it, we landed in this mercurial space with Risley that ended up feeling um, very comfortable, but was also probably the biggest challenge about voicing him, which was... You know, like this dude's beating the crap out of somebody and threatening to kill them. And then in the next, he's like buttoned up and drinking tea. Mm -hmm. But he's not like in that, like, I'm hiding an evil kind of way. It's like, well, it kind of depends on the circumstances. So, yeah, that was a it was an interesting ride finding his voice. And I think you really did it beautifully. And I, I, I mean, gosh, you're. I think much of your career, and you can correct me if this, if, if you don't believe this to be true, but I think a lot of characters you've gotten at least characters like Fire Emblem, and I know you've done other characters like Star Fox, there's this been this uh, military aspect or some sort of officer, official, yeah. um, ranking bits and pieces that have happened to you throughout your career, and you can truly see the authenticity from that perspective, not saying that what you your experience was is directly mm -hmm. these characters but you maybe have from my vantage point it looks like maybe you knew someone or you took inspiration like you just said from something you experienced and that's what really i think stands out to someone like me when i'm watching these games or playing these games when somebody really jumps off the page and you're like whoa whoa, whoa, whoa hang on that's that's very real and that's very authentic you know what i mean where it's it's such a it illuminates it's illuminated so well by how authentic and real it feels and i really think that you do that beautifully with this character that has such a mercurial uh, aspect of him and the dualities that happen between um and again contrasted from another character that's so about justice where your character is dealing with justice but by different means mm -hmm. sometimes it's like the what justice means above ground sometimes is not the same of what happens below ground right um, yeah. Which I just found fascinating. Um, yeah. Cool, man. I mean, listen, I would love to talk more. We'll get to this, but I would love to just get to know more about you before we get there. Yeah, sure. And um, 
A funny little tidbit is I saw that you grew up in uh, Sparta, New Jersey, which funny enough, I grew up in New Jersey as well. My partner, she is she's from um, Lafayette, New Jersey, which is oh, like yeah. right next door I mean, to I Sparta. I used to go to the, the, the Marquee Tavern slash Lafayette house. They have like some of the best French onion soup I think I had in New Jersey. I used to go there all the time. Oh my gosh, and this yeah. is something, so Keith, maybe bleep this part out, but her family owns a place called Bagful of Bagels, which is in Sparta. Dude, so I don't I've know. there. No shit. Yes. Oh my God, yeah, so that's her family. I'm, I'm there all the time when we visit back home. Did uh, my brother work there? No. I'm texting him right now, hang on. Uh, Dude, that would be crazy. Did you work at Bagful <laughs> of Bagels? I'm almost positive somewhere in here, like, because I just went to New Jersey again for like my 20 year high school reunion, and uh, I definitely either ate at Bagful of Bagels or. No. He did. My brother fucking worked there. What's your What's your brother's name? Steve. St oh my god, that's so funny, dude. Why is this world? I I say this a lot, and um. I, I, this world just gets smaller and smaller and smaller in certain different bizarre ways like this. That's so funny. Um, and same last name as you? Yeah, yeah. So did, are they the recent owners or were they the previous owners? They are the owners from the entirety of... Oh, okay. Yeah, they. that's her mom and dad have owned that place since it's been there. Um, and every time I go home, we go there. She's worked there. So, she, so he probably knows. Ask him if he knows Allison Miller. Um... That's so funny because that's. I mean, uh, I don't think he he worked there like you know, fifteen years ago. Yeah, um, but uh, I'll I'll I'll, I'll drop I'm dropping it in there. That's yeah, so funny. We're, we're way off the path here. But yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> he's, 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 he's he says maybe he doesn't recollect. Wow. Anyway. Oh my gosh. So where yes. are you from? I am from Hazlitt, New Jersey, which is Monmouth County. Um, okay. I, I grew up in um, Hazlitt, and then I, I did some school in Jersey. Um, yeah, Allie right now is flipping out all caps. Are you kidding me? What That's went so anyway? That's so funny. Uh, but yeah, so I you know I grew up in Jersey. I, I lived in New York, moved to Jersey. I did high school there, and then I moved after college. But um, yeah. So for you, uh, so you growing up in Sparta, uh, what I, I I watched a video of you saying you really had no background or experience in no. acting, and maybe you did a couple of plays. But I, I find that, and again, I, I know people probably said this to you, I find that insane because of your meticulous understanding. I've watched videos of you breaking down characters, and it seems so ingrained in like your DNA that this performance background. What was it about acting prior to even getting involved in this that interests you or interested you as a kid? Did you have moments of like, um, you watched you obsessed with movies, you read a lot of books? What part of performance or storytelling stood out to you as a kid? Yeah, I think the hinge of it is storytelling, right? Um, although I never wanted to be an actor and didn't even know what a voice actor was until 2013. <laughs> um, there was always like, I was always attracted to stories. I was always reading books. I would read, I would read between 40 and 50 books as like a year Whoa. as a kid. Um, and I was always playing like the, the core component of a video game, like, did it have a good story? It didn't matter. You know, like I was playing games to the story. I wasn't playing games to, to, to grind or like Metroidvania was like never really my thing. Like it, it had to have a story. I grew mm -hmm. up on final, the final fantasies and, uh, you know, eventually like games like Xenogears and Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. Oh my God. You're and, speaking my uh, language. I know. Right. <laughs> and so it really like, it became about, cause acting my philosophy on acting, right? I, I still really have no, not that much formal training. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've done little workshops and classes to fine tune things and kind of like work on the raw material. But, uh, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid and you're out in the playground, right? You're like, and this, I'm stealing this from Nolan North because he, 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 he described it so well in an interview I saw of him. Mm -hmm. Where he's like, you're on the playground, you're like, I'm a dragon, I'm a dragon, I'm a dragon. And your mom comes out and goes... You want to pee by your own Yeah, mom. I'm a dragon. It takes that. Like it takes one second for you to get into your imagination and be something else, but still based on the aggregate of your experience, right? Mm -hmm. You're that dragon as a kid based on the aggregate of your experiences as a kid pretending to be a dragon. And we spend the first half of our lives forgetting how to do that. Yeah. Right? And the second half of our lives trying to remember. <laughs> That's just kind of how it, it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and acting, all acting is, is remembering how to do that, is remembering how to play. 
And for me, you know, like I've had my issues with breaking through levels of vulnerability that, you know, get hammered out of you in, in life and work and the military and relationships and all those things. Yeah. And opening that up has led to a different level of my, my acting career. But for me, it's always been about stories. I think stories are, are the currency of emotion. Like we exchange them with each other to do the one thing that we can't explain, which is give somebody else his point of view. Yeah. I can tell you all day what it's like to be somebody else, but until you get behind their eyes in a story, you don't really know. And it's, you mm. know, it's analogous, it's, it's metaphorical, it's all that stuff. But um, storytelling and analyzing storytelling has always been a part of me. And I guess maybe that translated to the acting part, despite not really having any training. Sure. And I, th you know, I love talking to people like you who have this type of life transition and, and, and understanding of yourself that eventually becomes a very successful actor um, and you kind of made me think about this right now for the first time in a way you know when you go to acting school I've, I've, I went to acting school for college but prior to that I didn't I had no understanding same like you I didn't even know you could become an actor mm -hmm. and I kind of jumped right into a college aspect of it where they're not really teaching you the fundamentals they just kind of throw you in there and they just teach you to listen and respond and it's not like when you go to school to study like mathematics where they're like you're going to study this test and you're going to memorize these equations and or if you're going to biology and you're going to memorize these compounds and you're going to memorize the periodic table and when you get really good at that and you memorize it you get a good test score and that's when you apply for grad school acting is not like that it's literally just removing a lot of these walls we build up and there's no really like there's no test that if you pass fail makes you a good actor it has nothing to do with any of those academic metrics that so many other professions deal with and I think it's very encouraging for people to hear that because there's so many different ways that you can find what it is about you that makes you a good actor or allows you to be vulnerable or allows you to understand storytelling, allows you to understand and something I think you're very good at. I watched a video of you doing all these Overwatch, um, like uh, how yeah. to do those voices, and it was fascinating. I literally just clicked on it to like watch just to see like I thought it was just one, and then I wound up was like, damn, I watched that whole video, that whole string of videos, nice. because you have found a way, and I think this is brilliant for people to if you haven't I'm work Keith link this video right now at this moment in this video because you break down mechanically physically in your body where resonance is where your physical we watch you I watch you your physicality change and that is so important for creating character mm -hmm. um, and it's not something that you can necessarily just memorize a couple of things on a page you know for you open your SAT book and right. you're like okay now I'm the, <laughs> I'm proficient at doing this it's no it's it's in your body it's things you learned as a kid and um w was that a part of who you were i mean i know you said storytelling but then from the the performance aspect of it i mean i think about the military being so polar opposite of mm -hmm. you know uh <laughs> allowing you to be free and fun and and zany were you just that way with your friends as a kid at the playground or like where was that part of it no for you? it's kind of interesting because I, I i i've talked about this you know a lot in interviews were like I'll get this sort of similar question you know like you have folks like Billy West right yeah uh, and and tons of people who are like huge in in the industry and they all kind of have a similar story it's like I got in trouble a ton when I was a kid because mm. I was weird right like I got in trouble because I made silly voices and I was always experimenting and I was always doing this no I really like I, I have no idea like you know it wasn't there I, it wasn't like in the military giving briefings as Donald Duck <laughs> or anything like that right um so, you know, just it took some time for me to figure out how I was doing what I was doing. Mm. You know, like like many people, like you just start doing something and then like, well, someone, well, how do you do that? Well, I, damn, I don't really know. You know, like, I guess I have to figure out what am I doing with this when I'm making this voice? How do I do that impression? OK, I feel like my voice is moving up and down. Oh, there's a range here. I can make a vocal. I'm, now I call them vocal variables. I can make a vocal variable about this where I can slide this attribute one way and slide this attribute another way. And that cross section will work for my vocal anatomy. And that's just kind of something I came up with through the course of doing some of those videos. Yeah. Um, and uh, and now like I codified it and now I teach that like I, I've like, okay, now this is a system that I call vocal variables and here are the variables you can make and how they, you know, they slide, there's opposites and you can move from one end to the other and yeah. it creates because, you know, there are infinite points between two integers, uh, there are infinite characters you can make therefore with just a couple of slides yeah. and you can move them around no matter how 
vocally um, not acrobatic you may be, right? Yeah. There's still something you can do with your voice. That's a th- and, and again, going back to the education part of it is is that is something you can learn. You mm-hmm. can learn the mechanics of your physiology and how to manipulate various parts of your body and your voice and your breath and your lungs and everything, your 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 mouth. Um, and to see you understand that and break that down in that way, I guess it just comes from you having to go and do that investigative work for yourself. Yeah. Try, 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 and be like, okay, now reverse engineer. How did that happen? Yep. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing, and it's a it's a great moment um, to to bring up. You have this voice acting academy that I've you know I've seen the videos for, and I've watched some of your YouTubes, and it seems like such a a brilliant place for people to who are interested in voiceover from someone like you who really. Uh, had such the polar opposite career to figure out how to break into this industry, figure out what it was that made you unique and figure out the mechanics of your body to be able to work in various genres. Where was the inception for starting this or cultivating all, I think you I said somewhere like you have like over a hundred episodes or, or, or little uh, mm-hmm. lessons within mm-hmm. this. That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of material. How um, did you cultivate all that and what was the inspiration for it? It all came from honestly being tired of answering the same questions over and over again. Everybody's (laughs) like, well, how'd you get into voice acting? Where's this? Where's this? Why did you do that? How did you do that? And I was like, you know what? And everyone's like, oh, do you coach? Do you coach? Do you coach? I'm like, I don't, I don't coach. I, it's, it's not, you know, like doing a one-on-one for an hour. I just, I don't have the time or, or, you know, and I really didn't think before I started teaching that I had like the, you know, the academic acumen to, to do it. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, I'm answering the same questions the same way for multiple people. And I think our industry suffers from severe myopia when it comes to how to build a career because Mm -hmm. everyone that teaches voice acting built their career in 1995, Mm -hmm. right? Essentially before the internet where you could, you move to LA with a dime in your pocket and a dream in your hand and you wait for an agent to go, kid, I'm going to make you a star. And then boom, you know, like you work three McDonald's spots in a year and you make $200,000, right? Yeah. That ain't happening anymore, right? No. The industry has vastly changed. Now, those coaches are still extremely valuable from a, here's how to break down a piece of commercial copy perspective. But where's the rest of the industry? Like where is how to find work? on your own without an agent because 70% of voice actors say that less than 20% of their income come from their agents, right? So where's that other 80%? Where are you finding it? How do you find it? How do you direct market? How do you negotiate? How do you find your own rates? How do you build a studio? And then how do you break down copy? Like when you, like, how do you tell the difference between ABC? What's workflow like? How do you not get in trouble on social media? All these things that have become the core of voice acting are not taught, yeah. right? The only thing that's taught is how do I make a funny voice? Hmm. Or how do I make, how do I be conversational in a commercial? So what I did is instead of coaching, I put together my career and my career has been very broad because I've done both things, right? I've done the kid, I'm going to make you a star LA agent, you know, Incredibles 2 movie production and, you know, lead actor in a Lego series. And I've done tons of boring e-learning presentations that pay amazing. And I've, you know, I've done audiobooks and determined that that wasn't for me. And I did dubbing and then like did all the math on ROI. And then I put it all together and said, here is how, here is the industry, right? Yeah. From my perspective, this is how I went from not having any experience to making a ton of money in voice acting and doing a ton of great work. Yeah. Um, you do it, right? I'm, I'm empowering you because the industry was not set up to empower you, it was set up to gatekeep you. Um, And not like in an intentional negative, like gatekeeping uh, way, but in a, if you want to learn voice acting, you must pay $300 an hour for a coach every week until you book something, which Mm. is $10,000 a year, Mm. right? Like if you're gonna really go that route, workshops and coaches, you're gonna spend $10,000 a year and still not know where to find work. Yeah. Right. And still have somebody say, well, it's time for you to make a demo and go to an agent. And that's like, well, nobody makes money that way. Like not nobody, but like, you know, a significant portion of the industry doesn't make money that way. Absolutely. Um, So that's how the Academy came around. And now it's since grown. I have several different programs. There's that main course. And then there's like a tackling pay to plays because I was the number one voice on voices.com and voice one, two, three for a really long time. And I know that system and I can teach it. Yeah. Um, I have a, like a group coaching program uh, and I have other stuff that's coming out 
all over uh, the course of the year. So it's it's become wild. Like it's yeah. just become this this breathing organism. Uh, and I, I just like, I turned into an entrepreneur over the last year. It's been wild. <laughs> but you really have a, I mean, I don't know if this is the military background in you, but you really have a knack for that, like breaking it down and figuring out ways to strategically 100%. deliver this uh, a product that is and for a lot of our listeners by nature i think a lot of them are very interested in voiceover we have a lot of people i think it's a a wonderful resource and it was kind of a similar inception for me in creating this podcast very similarly a lot of people who were talking about the industry teaching this stuff wonderful people but not a contemporary look at what the industry yeah. is like today. And I like to talk to people who have contemporary stories because that's something you can learn for, from and mm -hmm. steal from and emulate aspects of things that work for you. Mm -hmm. So hearing something like this that's available for people, I could not endure something like that more. Um, I, I think that learning from the people, again, like you've said, you know, script analysis and, and understanding character, wonderful. But even from a college perspective, I talk with my alma mater, NYU, all the time, and I'm like... I love the training that I got and I thought it was fantastic, but you did not give me the tools to make a career out of exactly out of learn like great, I know how to do these certain things as an actor. I can I, I, I get that. But now where do we again, like you're saying, find the work. How do I apply this to finding agent, finding where to list my stuff, getting the when should I get the demo and all these other huge and ninety percent of the industry mm -hmm. is navigating this life of finding work, doing auditions, marketing yourself, creating a brand, whatever all those things may be, LinkedIn, all the stuff that goes involved with that. You yep. know, there's so much that they don't even touch upon because most of the people who run these universities, God bless their soul, they don't know, they, th that is not relative to, to them today. You don't right. have 20 year olds, 30 year olds um, running universities. You've got people right. in their 70s and 80s and right. but it's just not the same world anymore. So. Exactly. Um, I'm glad that you've done that. It's a wonderful resource. We'll definitely be, be tagging that um, here in, in, in the video and stuff for people to check out. Um, where was it for you prior to all this stuff um, that you made the decision to say you were going to pursue a military career? Because I also saw that you have a lot of musical interests. Uh, you know, you play a lot of instruments. That background was clearly present for you in some. I see a guitar in your background. I've seen your your Fire Rumble video you just did with the sac saxophones. Yeah. That was wonderful. Um, so clearly, that's always existed. At least there was a glimmer of this artistic background that was, mm -hmm. you know, either put aside to join the military. How did that decision come about to join the military, and uh, and why? What was the impetus to do that? Yeah. So. It's a conversation that I've had several times with like my family and it remains one of the great mysteries of my life because I don't come from a military pedigree, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, my grandparents served in World War II, like everybody's grandparents, but it's not like I come from uh, a line of military officers, right? Sure. One day when I was 13, I went downstairs and I said, hey, mom, I'm going to join the Air, I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy specifically. Mm. And she was like, do you know where it is? And I was like, I have no <laughs> idea. Neither of us remember why I made that choice, but it was yeah. like... I came downstairs one day. I don't remember seeing a commercial. I don't remember seeing anything on TV or a billboard or talking to anybody. We do not know. Like there, it is, it is, a, it is a, a missing piece of, of Joe Zija history as to why Whoa. the hell I made that choice. <laughs> but um, I did it, and uh, the path that I thought I was going to do. Like I, I remember being like, I'm going to be a fighter pilot, right? Like that mm. was the idea. My eyes were so bad that like I was very much not medically qualified to be a, a fighter <laughs> pilot, which I found out pretty quickly um, upon getting to the Air Force Academy uh, and then ended up going into intelligence. And I thought that um, I thought that it was going to be my career, right? Like yeah. I thought probably what I would do is I would do, uh, we call it five and dive. Like you do your commitment and then you leave five yeah. years. I ended mm -hmm. up doing about six years and then one of the reserves. Uh, and then I was a government contractor. I worked for the government doing similar stuff and uh, figured that that's how I was going to retire, right? Um, never even thought about music as a career. And I think it's just because, like, I've always been, like, an analytical, achievement-addicted individual. And <laughs> music doesn't make money, right? Like, it's, it's, it's hard as hell oh, yeah. to make money as a musician. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I never, I never even considered going to school for music, but that doesn't mean I left it behind. I actually, um, I started the first ever jazz band at the United States Air Force Academy, uh, which is still there. And I started the first ever a cappella group um, with some friends of mine, and that's also still there. They actually ended up on America's Got Talent uh, about six years ago, Whoa. which is funny. Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, music was my first love. It never left me, but uh, it's always, it's always going to be the side piece, I think. Yeah. Did you, did you find music just growing up? Did you pick up a guitar? Did someone give you an instrument? Or was it like, I remember for me, music found me through that, you know, you joined grade school and they're like, what do you want to play? You know, and I was That's like, oh, pick that happened. one. My dad played guitar, um, just acoustic guitar. He was like a like a Bob Dylan esque singer songwriter kind of vibe. Like that was his vibe. Yeah. Uh, and so like I you know I would hear him play guitar. He wasn't formally trained or anything, um, and I didn't learn guitar until late, much later in my musical life. Um, and it really I think it became one of those things. Like fourth grade, what instrument do you want to play? Clarinet. I have no idea why, but I picked clarinet, mm -hmm. and then uh, picked it up, enjoyed it. Um, in sixth grade, they were like, well, jazz band auditions are next week and clarinet's not in the jazz band. I was like, okay, screw you, I'll play sax. So like <laughs> I picked up sax and then like, you know, two years later, they were like, we're starting a woodwind ensemble, we need a French horn player. And I was like, okay, I'll play that. And so yeah. I learned French horn and then in high school, uh, they were like, hey, uh, we want you to be in the pit orchestra for the sound of music. Here's a book. Um, your part is clarinet, tenor sax, alto sax, and flute. And I was like, okay, I'll play flute. And that's just kind of like how, how most of my music career, wow. uh, career went. Um, I picked up piano and guitar somewhere in there and just, uh, yeah, it, music ebbs and flows. It's either I'm like dedicated to it for a little while and yeah. see, like see some improvement and, and enjoy myself. And then I kind of fall off and it, it, you know, gets subsumed by other things in life. I mean, that's one thing I've seen so much about you, and I've seen you talk about this, you know, that kind of ebb and flow philosophy of life and dedicating time to things and, and multitasking being kind of a difficult thing to achieve. I've mm -hmm. seen you say that, and I find it fascinating. I see a lot of similarities, similarities in myself and you where – on paper, there are so many things like I, the the web of various industries and things and interests, streaming right. and music and uh, creating a, a, a whole academy. It's like there's so much and doing the the cosplays, the the Kickstarter for the mm -hmm. Risley video. Mm -hmm. There's just so many things. You imagine it's being someone who's extremely multitasked, but uh, I almost get the impression that it's like you said, you find those um, moments to dedicate to yep. to those things I and don't find completion. In multitasking at all. Um, I actually, I teach a whole workflow module in my course, just on general workflow. I have five principles that I developed, but one of the basic things I say is that there's no such thing as multitasking. There is intentionally doing many things badly at the same time, <laughs> right? That's what multitasking is. It is intentionally being bad at several things at once. Yeah. You must go from one thing to another and give it your focus or you will do it badly. Like yeah. you just will. I, I totally agree with that, and I I, I think it's a beautiful uh, philosophy to to incorporate into your life, especially in this career as a voice actor, where it uh, you see people diversifying a lot to find various ways to capitalize on um, uh, making it a sustainable career. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see you'll see people trying to do, I mean, acting in general. You know, there's people who are pursuing on-camera work. They're pursuing commercial work, print work. Mm -hmm. They're also pursuing uh, other stunt work, acrobatics. There's just various things of trying to navigate this industry. And while I believe that it's good to be uh, proficient in certain things, I think when you try to throw the crap at the wall and see what sticks... I find that to be a very difficult thing for uh, people to actually break through um, yeah. and find there's sustainability. There's diversity and then there's dilution, right? Like mm. those, those are two different things and I think they often get conflated. That's, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know what? I was curious too before I get too far from this. Um, with that music, that time period, I mean, gosh, clarinet, saxophone, I, the, the piano, I hear these instruments and you're learning them in grade school. Where Was it like you you became obsessed with those? Because to see you play them today still, and I don't know if that's like you said, that ebbs and flows in your life, like did it become like I've, I found this instrument, now I'm obsessing all of my time into figuring out how this works with not having that background prior in your life? So I think what it what it was for me in grade school is like I'm not – this might sound counterintuitive, but I'm not super self-motivating, right? Like if I don't have a carrot to chase, I'm probably uh, not going to do it, which mm -hmm. is why like, you know, my piano skills right now, not really up to snuff, right? Like I'm not, if, I, if I'm not with a teacher who is going to like, you know, I have to be someplace every week and I, I'm going to be embarrassed if I didn't practice, you know, like that kind of thing. Like I'm not yeah. doing it. If I don't have a sax album, you know, I'm not going to probably pick up my horns. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was lots of ways to you know, like I'm auditioning for different bands, I'm practicing pieces for each of those bands, I'm auditioning for, you know, like your, your all state 
jazz or like your all-state orchestra and stuff like that and that kind of you know once you get that then you're you know you're performing that piece over and over and you're practicing it and i had teachers right so like again yeah. i had a weekly check-in with a, a clarinet teacher or a sax teacher um and that was kind of like my way to to motivate interesting so it's, it sounds like your environment was creating these goals for you or these challenges to rise to or overcome or to Absolutely. achieve success do you find that for most things in your life or do you find that you have now created a system for yourself of creating obstacles or because it's it, it seems kind of in a way like you could you could engineer that to be like well if i want to be really good at something i'm going to create that thing that i want to do like i'm going to find that pie in the sky and to, to chase that. Is You're that something exactly you do? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And one thing led to the other and for better or for worse, I, I talk about this all the time uh, about like, you know, uh, managing burnout and, and like biting off more than I can chew because I'm certainly guilty of both of those things. Sure. In the military, right? It doesn't matter or in any, any, many corporate environments, your input has no real effect on your output, right? In the military, uh, the, the, we always make this joke like, uh, what do you call the person who graduates dead last at the Air Force Academy, lieutenant, <laughs> right? Like it's mm -hmm. just, it doesn't matter how, how, like it didn't matter if I busted my ass for four years at that place yeah. or if I slacked off and did the bare minimum at the end of it, I got butter bars, I got a commission and I was an officer, right? Yeah. Your input doesn't necessarily at all affect your output. Now there's, you know, like, you know, for the greater good, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're working for, for uh, uh, something that's bigger than yourself. Sure. When I left, the input and output were one-to-one -one ratio. So yeah. I could increase that input as much as I wanted to, to the detriment of my mental health, right? Like, I, it was yeah. just like, I could go achieve everything, right? And I still struggle with that. You know, it's like... I guess I'll come up with an entire school system. And then like, you know, once I have that on autopilot, okay, cool. That's kind of running. I've got ads that's kind of say, all right, I'm going to start this group coaching program. Uh, I'm going to start a Kickstarter. So yeah. that's, that's my own, that's the poison I dose myself with. All yes, the time. Yeah, sure. But I think, I think there is something in there that is extremely valuable. And again, I think it goes back to that core principle of like, it's, it's not a multitask thing. It's a go create that, that goal for yourself, achieve or, or create some sort of uh, stability within what that goal was aiming for. And then you can shift your focus. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm as long guilty. as you make sure to get one thing done before you move on to the other. That's all. Yeah, I mean, my my partner, she's a writer, and all the time she'll be like, um, writing eight things. At the, I'm like, why don't you? I, and I understand writing has its own, and I know yeah, you probably. It, yeah. it, it's a different kind of beast in a way where you lose creative juice, and you gotta yeah. put that down to a certain degree. But I'm like. At some point, you're gonna have one thousand half finished scripts. Let's, uh, you know, let's let's focus on. <laughs> let me help you get one to the to the finalization uh, point where we can move Absolutely. that to the next stage, and that's a whole other thing uh, creatively. Um, so, okay, fascinating. You moved from um, school with the music, going into the Air Force, um, and I've seen you talk about this, so I won't get into that story to a certain degree. You made a choice um, to pivot from the military to pursuing uh, voiceover, mm -hmm. um, and you decided to pack up and go to Los Angeles, correct? Mm -hmm. That was your kind of first stop on that journey. When you first arrived in Los Angeles, what was that like being kind of, you just you landed in LA or you drove here, whatever it was, and it's like, okay, I'm here. What was like that first week, month, or year like of navigating that world? So I'll back it up a little bit because there's a little bit of nuance that will provide some clarity okay. in that. So I didn't immediately, like, I didn't quit my government job and move to LA, right? Yeah. In the, in the same span. I started voice acting, found that it was financially feasible over the next year or so, eight months or so, then talked to my job and went, hey, I can't do two jobs. I'm burning out. I'm out earning you. Do you want me to go part-time or do you want me to quit? Your call. And they were like, well, we'll see if we could do part-time. So it was very nice of them to let me go part-time. So then sure. I went part-time for the next eight months and continued to build my voice acting career and slowly phased out my government job. So it was a very smooth transition uh, influenced 100% by finances, right? Mm. I could see the dollar dollars in the bank and yeah. know that I wasn't putting anybody in jeopardy, right? I had a kid. I just, I just had my first kid. Uh, so I, I wasn't putting my wife or my kid in jeopardy. I was, the, I've only always been the only breadwinner. Uh, and I knew that like that was on my shoulders. So yeah. it was a slow, easy transition motivated entirely by dollar signs. Um, 
And then it became, then I, I quit and I stayed home from my home studio in Virginia for another, gosh, eight to nine months while I tried to decide like, well, where do I take this thing that I've made? Like I've yeah. made this voice acting career, where do I go? Um, and I had a manager at the time that was like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd, I'd love to go into games and animation. And she said, you have no choice. You must move to LA. Sure. Uh, and I will say that like, you know, just a little piece of backstory that I was on the cusp. I mean, like hours before buying a house in New Jersey to move back to New Jersey. Uh, and the loan fell through. Oh. The loan fell through because I no longer had a job. And despite the fact that I was making a killing in voice acting, the bank goes, no, you made $18,000 last year, right? Like, yeah. you, I'm not lending you money. So I couldn't get a mortgage. And it was like, well, I guess I'll move to LA. Um, so it was slower than that, right? Okay, and it, okay. again, like I always caution people, never quit everything and move to LA. It's, it's idiotic. Like That's you're very... just setting yourself up to wait tables for 10 years because then you can't focus on your career. Yep. I moved to LA already being successful. If I never booked a job, not one, if I never booked a single job in LA, I'd have been good. Yep. I'd have been golden. So those first year, that first year in LA was a mix of keeping it going, right? Like keeping my career going and what you had already that you developed already. Right? Yeah. yeah. Maintaining that solid base and figuring out, you know, sometimes painfully that the LA market was quite different from the non LA market mm -hmm. and it was much slower and it was based on trust and relationships and slow progress. So like I expected to land in LA and kick in the door, right? Yeah. And it didn't work that way. It was slow. Uh, I went through two LA agents before I found my home at Atlas in 2017, who I've been with ever since. But I went through some big agencies and like could not get the traction I needed or wanted from mm -hmm. them because I was some schmuck from Virginia, right? Like, sure, I was booking, and but like for them to trust me um, took a while and it just didn't jive. And, huh. you know, so it was more realizing that like, LA was a different career. Yeah. Um, and I still sort of maintain that, right? Like there's a, there's a lot to VO and almost none of it is in LA. So like I, I came out here thinking it was just gonna be a continuation, but it was actually almost like opening up a new line of business. Sure, yeah, I mean, very important distinction there too. So many people think, and while things are changing to a certain degree, specifically with video games and animation, we are seeing a pivot back to recording in studio. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are making that a preference, but there is such a tremendous world that is outside of the video games, animation, anime, whatever that might be, that exists everywhere. And nobody knows about it. It is like this unspoken thing, but I mean, granted, you have courses like yours or other people that have become very successful at it. Um, and I think it's... For a lot of people, specifically that I've seen in my life that I've encountered and spoken to, they get interested because they want to be in video games, anime, and animation. Right. That becomes the big interest. Right. And I was just talking with a buddy, another very successful voice actor who we probably both know, and we were just talking about it. It's like the amount of people who probably exist making a living only doing animation, video games, and anime from like booked work alone. One percent of the industry. If that, if that, if that, if that, it is so much sustained by doing everything else. Um, I mean, granted, we're seeing a whole uh, world where conventions are supplementing income for people. Yes, and there's a reason yes. there is a reason for that, because it is so hard to just only do one thing within this industry. Um, the promo, the things in the regional markets, the the uh, audiobooks, I, IDR. That's why I teach diversity as much as I can. You got you need a diverse, stable career base. Yes. People think that they're like the pyramid of VO. They think that the bottom is what you see, which is the games and animation. But that's the tip, man. Yeah. The bottom is all the unsexy stuff. The 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 IVR, the train announcers, the audiobooks, the e-learning, the corporate videos. There's yeah. so much content. Did you know that the e-learning industry? is worth over three times as much as the video game industry by dollar. <laughs> I did not know three that. Three times, right? And it doesn't take that much to produce it, right? Yeah. So like, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I teach this all the time. Like, yeah. you're missing the point. I know. Uh, it's it, it, and, and, it, and granted, I think because um, growing up, a lot of people, they resonate. Like, you know, most of us are not being like, I loved that e-learning thing right, as a kid exactly. and I wanted to pursue e-learning. Exactly. I get it. I totally get it. Um, but I, I mean, trust me, I do a lot of mentoring to kids out of uh, – college they're transitioning from being a graduate into the real world and uh i hear their plans i hear their their visions and stuff and they set me up with a lot of times people who are interested in voice acting and uh you kind of express this stuff to them and they're kind of like no i'm gonna be on uh the next looney tunes like whatever that is cool if even if you are you're probably will be broke you know like that was congratulations you made a thousand dollars and that's it Yes. Yes. It's I mean, and I, and I love illuminating this to people. I know for some people it's d- discouraging, but it is regardless of how I feel, you feel, anyone feels, the reality of that indus- of this industry today, especially with streaming saturation, with mm-hmm. the competition amongst so many studios coming up. You know, it's not the world where it was where if you did a commercial, you know, you did the Cheetos commercial, you were good for five years. It's just yeah. not that way anymore. Yeah. Um, so I, I really love bringing that to light for people. Um, I, you said that when you, you moved out here, you, you noticed you went through the various agencies. It was a different sport. Granted, um, you know, because of things like uh, IMDb and behind the voice actors, it's easy to see how much success you've had in this LA industry, in this LA market. You ha- You did find a way to break through. So what changed for you? Or was there a job that you kind of broke through or understood something different about this? Or was there something you did that led to a lot of the success that you've now had in video games so, and animation? I think, and it's hard for me to analyze, right? There's, there's a lot of different, you know, as, as voice actors, we plant seeds everywhere and we try to figure out like w- which one's gonna grow. Yeah. Um, one of the things that really helped me was this, this is going to sound flippant, but not caring. Um, I was in a workshop. My first workshop ever was with uh, Charlie Adler, who's an awesome phenomenal voice actor, now director and, and just a Titan in the industry. And, uh, you know, I'm in a room full of nervous actors, like just nervous newbies. And I was still pretty new. Yeah, maybe a year and a half. I'd been doing it a year and a half, two years. And uh, he came out. I came out of the the booth, and he looked at me, and he goes, two years? You've been doing this for two years?" And I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "How are you so calm?" And I said, "Charlie, can I swear on this podcast?" Is sure, that cool? absolutely. If I fuck up in there, nobody dies. Because <laughs> I've been there. Yeah. Right. It's like this comparison where it's like, a, I'm talking into a microphone. It's not war, man. Yeah. B, I had a career. I could walk into any audition and not need it. Mm -hmm. The best way, this is one of my little catchphrases, the best way to sound like you don't need the job is to not need the job, right? So I was able to try lots and lots of different things and let it all roll off. You got to remember that like, you know, even me, like even being successful in an industry, I still don't book 90% of the work I audition for. for right? All of us. Ten, oh my God, 10% booking radio ratio? Oh, wow, what a dream. You're a you god know, in it, the it's industry. Like I'm constantly being told no. Um, it was about taking those no's and just letting them roll off and moving on to the next one. And finding, uh, so building that LA career was slow. It started with going to a couple of workshops and getting introduced to places that I wanted to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and being, being personable, not being a jerk, right? Like be, being good in the booth. Sure. Yeah. Like I got in the booth and, you know, did my thing mm-hmm. and then got out and wasn't weird. You know, like I, you know, shake hands, look people in the eye, be personable. Don't talk about work. Don't, don't like try to fish for, for more contact information. Just be a normal human being. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found that like, I was able to cultivate those relationships and they'd say, yeah, sure. Um, why don't we bring you in for you know, guard number seven, you know, like man number five. Yeah. And that's the way I started in, uh, at Bang Zoom. Uh, and then it was like a bunch of those like that. Uh, and then bam, it was Achilles from Fate Apocrypha. I was like a, a lead in a series. And then they just kept bringing me in for stuff yep. at another studio, other studios like PCB and Cup of Tea who record like Yakuza and Persona and yep. then Fire Emblem respectively. Um, Cup of Tea who recorded Fire Emblem was because 
it's it's so funny when you look at like this chain of events, right? Okay. Sure. So I booked Fate Apocrypha. I say, it's 2016, I don't know anybody. And I go, hey, do you all wanna come to my house and screen it, right? And I'm, so I'm like emailing people I've never met, all the other actors in the, and I'm like, hey, you wanna, you wanna come over and play? Uh, and uh, they're like, yeah. So like 30 people show up at my house, including like the owner of, of Bang Zoom and like people that I had known before, like just all these people, right? Like, yeah. and that's how I met all of them. Yeah. And like just had a party at my house. So we watched it and we just enjoyed it. We had a good time. I did it again for a Hunter Hunter movie that we were all in. Um, and that's how I met Chris Hackney. And one of the people that I met there mentioned two cup of tea. There's this guy, Joe, he just got into town. He's really good. And they went, oh, that's interesting. And then they found me, sent me an audition and I knocked it out of the park. And they went, oh. And I went in and then the session was like 10 minutes and they were like, that was really fast. Okay, cool. Nice to meet you, Joe. Yeah. Then Claude, right? That, that's how it went. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's about, and that, that was like my impatience was like, I thought Claude should come first. You know what I mean? Like I was like, oh, I'm a successful actor. I'm moving to LA. No, man, you gotta, it is a risk to put any new actor in the booth, right? <sighs> It doesn't matter how good your audition is. Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, it matters how good your audition is. But it's, you sure, know, like, I see you don't like know that. what that person's going to be like. So some social capital is also good to, to build. And that's kind of what I did through workshops and just being me, yeah. right? Not going to networking events and not like forcing my business card. I don't even think I had a business card. It was just like, hey, you're cool. Let's have a conversation. You know, yeah. like oh, you do such and such, that's cool. I do, you know, like, and then just make friends, like be yeah. a normal person. And then the rest will happen. Don't force it. Um, and that's kind of how it worked for me. Um, and then, you know, finding agents out here after my like third agent, where I kind of like, I had really good expectations and they had really good expectations. And I was like, I want you to send me everything you have. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay. Uh, and then I kind of became known as their kind of like, diverse can do anything kind of player. Yeah. And then, you know, they were the ones saying, Hey, I got this guy, Joe, you should listen to him. And then making those relationships and, you know, it's slow. But yeah. this is, you know, I'm describing eight years here. Uh, yes. Be very clear that the buildup of this. And again, like you said, prior to even moving out to Los Angeles, you had been doing this and finding stability yep. in your own way. It's not just like, okay, one day this, next day that, and now I'm the lead in Fire Emblem Three Houses. It does not happen right. like that. And that's the thing I love talking about. And there's so much in what you said that I think is extremely um, uh, valuable to anybody pursuing um, this industry. I mean, just bit by bit here going down the line, I think what you were saying about the confidence and not needing the job, that's something that, again... You, 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 you might think like, oh, I'm not nervous right now, but underneath it, it's like you can smell it. It's one of those things, being nervous and being confident, the two, whatever you know, aspect, however you want to define the, the ends of the spectrum there. Um, it is something that you can just like sense. You know what I mean? It's not something like you're somebody shaking all the time. It's mm -hmm. in the performance sometimes. It yeah. enforces and informs the way your read is. And it's that like uh, in dating, they always say that I, I don't give a fuck factor. You know what I mean? There's right. that sexual indifference or whatever where right. someone who'd, you know, the, the asshole is always the attractive guy. People are always attracted. Right. Yeah, they don't care. And there's something to that that is so primal in the way that we find interest uh, to the casting director, whoever's listening to it. When somebody doesn't have that desperation in their read, it is something that I don't think we can even define, you know, uh, performance by performance, but it's something you just sense, you feel, yep. you feel it. And that's so valuable for people to know. And I think for you, and it was something similar for me, when I moved out to LA, I had lived in New York City for eight years. It took me eight years of working as an actor, like finding stability within a lot of instability um, right. to work up the confidence to be able to purchase a car, f get, you know, get $10,000 nugget that I had to move out to L.A. to say, OK, I, I, I feel it's still risky. It's still extremely risky for me with what mm. my pursuit was um, as an artist for that long and that being my own only income to move out. And um, I think it was still 
if I didn't have that, if I didn't have clients that I was working with in New York already, to the second I got here and I built this home studio behind me, to mm-hmm. the second the pandemic hit when I moved here, I was oh, yeah. ready to go and everybody Shit. wasn't. They were hitting me up like crazy. Like it all happened very divinely to a certain extent. But yep. having the confidence to know when I move here, I have this that I'm, I'm prepared for. And then when I moved here, I was still confident that I wasn't desperate for every single job that came around. So when those when th- those reads in the descriptions that always say natural, real person, conversational, when those promo spots, those commercial spots, those characters in video games where they wanted them to basically be film performances came around, I was I was able to do that. Yep. I wasn't so thirsty. Right. Um, didn't mean I didn't work hard, like I'm sure it was for you. Yeah, exactly. You just didn't, you know, smell of desperation. Um, And the other aspect of that, too, I want to touch upon is that being somebody who exists outside this world of voiceover, it it wasn't your identity. You have such a rich life history. I mean, obviously, a a bit of that is having so many years behind you. You know, I think you said you started at 28, where this wasn't a part of your life. You had a life and an identity and Mm -hmm. an understanding of yourself that wasn't dependent upon your success as a voice actor. Which is very attractive to people in this industry because it's like, for a second, I don't got to talk about that one audition or job or the popular anime video game. It's like such a breath of... And I think you find that as you get success in the industry. Um, When you start out, I think you think like that's all you want to talk about. And then when you find success, you're just like, it's the last thing I want to talk about. I I want to talk about... Yeah, we talk about video games or something. Yeah, like you want to... Let's play cards. Yeah, anything else to to connect on the human level um, because so much of this town is saturated in the industry in the business it gets so monotonous and that was a thousand percent how I approached making relationships with people in the industry is like the last thing like if I meet a casting director the last thing I'm talking to them about is casting the first (laughs) thing I'm talking to them about is their dog yeah you know like it's it's just like let's talk about being people yeah and that's so important for people to learn um it's it sounds so reverse of what you would think it is um but it just having trust and faith and being a good person and being someone you can chum it up with um have a drink if that's something you do or whatever yeah. it is just shooting the shit talking about the super bowl um mm-hmm. these things while it seems almost like engineered it's at the end of the day it's existing as a human being outside of the it's industry it. it's yeah. it it should be low effort <laughs> exactly. There's no like, uh, like here's the playbook. Go to the the networking party, and I gotta ask this. I gotta. I here's the setup. Here's the punchline, yeah. and here's my business card. You know, yeah. that's no, so no. far away from what it is. Yeah. Um. So I mean, that's so fascinating. I think again, great for people to 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 learn. And um, I, I would love to talk about. I guess maybe what became one of your. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, when Fire Emblem came around, it seems to me, and maybe you correct me, um, that was from a public perspective, social media, video game clout. That was kind of a very big thing to happen. Um, that changed things from like um, uh, popularity. I don't know what the word is. Yeah, for perspective. you can call it, call it a breakthrough. I don't like sure. the term breakthrough or breakout, whatever. But it was it was certainly a, a breakthrough role for me yeah um now i had done it's interesting because i had i had done so much before that yeah uh you know like i had been fox mcleod i had been in in east combat i had been like you know i had been in some some big titles and big roles and big titles yeah but you know the value the value of anything is only what we give it right so you know if people didn't care about one role and like tons of people cared about claude uh it, it was a really cool moment, and I feel like you were probably about to ask a question, and I started talking. What, what no, was that actually, yeah. that's, I mean, basically, the the change, in, I mean, because, again, like you said, you've worked on such great things, and then you have this thing that breaks through, uh, not to say that it's you don't do a phenomenal job at it, and not to say that it's not popular for a reason, but these certain things get selected, and that it gives you an opportunity to be presented yeah. to the public. How did... Um, or did things change, whether maybe for you personally or professionally, after getting that job? Did you find a shift from the things you were interested in personally, because I know you streamed the game, um, or professionally? Did you find that that allowed your agents to pitch you in a different way, or you to pitch yourself a different way, or other people just knew you from doing that? What was the change just surrounding the success of that game and being a part of it? You know, the, the social media presence that I cultivated from that, it's really interesting. People think, and I've had other people uh, kind of get frustrated. You know, they jump into a game like Genshin or Fire mm-hmm. Emblem, right? 
and they they're like, well, you're like nothing happened. You know, like I like I was in a big role, but but nothing happened. What people fail to realize is that for about two years prior to um, booking Fire Emblem, right? I have been studying every social media platform on the planet and how its algorithm works, how hashtags work, how tags work, how SEO works. I've taken courses in YouTube content management, content production, filming, photography, thumbnails, all of it. Mm -hmm. I had studied it to the T so that when, and I had been producing content, uh, but that extra nudge of having like people that really cared about it wasn't there. Yeah. So when Fire Emblem came out, I was so ready. I was so prepared for that opportunity that it just exploded, Yeah. right? I could make interesting content based on that and then have it go viral every time, every time, every time. And so it became this idea like, well, okay, that's really interesting that this happened. And if there's anything I've learned in my career or in my life, it's, it's to flow, right? It's to flow around what happens. So I was like, okay, that this is happening. What do I do with it? Yeah. And then it became things like, okay, now I'm going to create some interesting content. I bet people would show up to my stream. That's very interesting. What can I do with this stream? Oh, that's funny. Kit Boga wants to have a conversation about, you know, scamming the scammer. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, like that's what an interesting opportunity that came from that. You know, like Shadowverse now wants me to host their show. And this is, wow, these are really fun interesting surrogate opportunities that came from the rather mundane task of making a goofy YouTube video or two, right? Yeah, um, it can be that sometimes. It, it can, right? So yeah. it was about like, okay, now there's this other biosphere of, uh, of uh, social media that now I've got something behind me, people are interested in me, and I was always very careful to try to make sure that the relationship I was cultivating with fandom was A, professional and never personal. Um, I don't talk about my kids. I don't talk about my wife. I don't talk about like, it, I don't talk about like those things. Sure. Um, and two, there was a two and now I've forgotten it. I promise it was there. It's yes. It was not talking about your kids or your family or it was being professional and not personal. Oh, well, and it, it'll, it'll, on, it'll yeah. come back to us at the moment. It'll, where it'll, we, this it'll is come back to us. But that's, I think it's fascinating um, and it's important because. Oh, no, I got it. I got oh, it. Oh, good. See, there we go. Professional um, and not about me as Claude. It was about Joe Zija, right? Like it was like, I don't want you to be involved in thinking that you, you're conflating my identity with Claude. And I was yeah. always so careful. As far as I know, I've never started a video with, hey, Claude here. It's always Joe Zija, the voice of Claude, right? Because I'm not here to present myself as a character. I do the same thing with Risley, any other character. Yeah. Uh, I would get cameos all the time that were saying like, you know, like, hey, can you say, can you say hello as Claude? And I would never would. It would always be like, hey, this is, Joe, I'm Joe. I'm a person. Voice I'm a voice Claude, actor. Yeah. There are other things I do that you know are more like that. You can. There's more to me than this character, and that's always what I tried to cultivate. So that when I try to do other efforts, there's people that are like, not like, ah, oh, it's not Fire Emblem. Screw it. You know, there's people like, oh, Joe's up to something. Yes. What's what's interesting about that? Um, and there you go. I think that's brilliant. Again, I, I was gonna touch touch upon the fascinating part of that is. Uh, it's it's a very fine line um, of how you've been able to again like as someone who's not multitasking find this entrepreneurial life that is creating a brand for yourself and various different ways that you can connect with people that are interested in various things whether it be voice acting whether it be a specific video game whether it be um, music or combining those in certain ways to um, I mean for lack of a better word capitalize on things that people are interested in create a yeah. fan base create a community create um uh your your own brand your own home base uh for people to find you and come to you and, and figure out what you're interested in through like okay uh, really studying the zeitgeist the culture of the things that people are interested in and figuring out ways to do the things that you like that connect with all those dots and i think that's what makes you successful as not only a voice actor as an actor but as an entrepreneur which i think is really valuable 
in this industry, it's like we were saying earlier, or I was touching upon, it's it's hard to make a career just doing one thing. It is. And, and even if you do, and even if you do at the end of the day, um, become successful in all of the various parts of this industry, um, you know, it's I, I think it is a missed opportunity if you have the capability to find your entrepreneurial entrepreneurial nature within it they kind of coincide to certain degrees with certain mm -hmm. people um whether that be through streaming or doing youtube or you know um whatever the thing for you that you know cosplaying even if that like there's various ways you yeah. can capitalize upon being in this in this industry and i think it's not for everybody and that's fine um but i find it very brilliant for someone like you who's found extreme success doing it and again it doesn't come by accident it comes by studying for years and no one sees that and you know right. you're not you know you're not always talking yeah. about that people just always assume um you've been you've been extremely um inspirational in the way you found uh, a success for people and it makes me w wonder uh obviously you're doing all these things and you found various ways of putting your interest um in the things like the risley music video cosplay combination i mean that's a beautiful way of of giving back to the fandom in such a uh, have a good time yeah. yeah it seems so funny congratulations on getting Thanks. there what is the things for you in your life that i mean i get you talked about things like chrono trigger and final fantasy are you playing games off stream is that your hobby in life uh, oh i know you said you used to uh, some, somewhere funny enough another uh, connection here i did parkour through all throughout my youth oh, cool. as, as a kid which is so funny i hurt myself more times than i can imagine um doing parkour which is why i don't do it anymore yeah. what are the things for you in life that you do that are not related to this industry that fill you with joy or is it is it the the, the projects you find within the industry that are I mean, the, the yeah. free time I'm, I'm lucky in that you know the things i do for work and make money like i enjoy immensely like i enjoy running a business and i enjoy managing a, a team now behind like my school and stuff yeah. like that um I enjoy making music and I was like, well, can I, you know, like, what can I, how can I integrate this with something? How do I, you know, how do I do that? I do play games off stream. My gaming rhythm has gotten much less as I've gotten older. I'm not playing, uh, like I, I think I just put in Jedi Fallen Order, you know, what am I, six years late on that game? <laughs> yeah. um, and I also, I find myself so often returning to classics and not playing new games. Uh, I don't what know are some why. of those classics that you like? I mean, like I just once every like five years or so, I'll run Final Fantasy in order. Yeah. And this time there was the pixel remaster, so usually I do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's like that was the core. Yeah. Um, uh, but this year I started at one, uh, and I was like, well, because I want to play the pixel remasters. And yeah, I played yeah. One those were great. Pixel remasters, they were cool. Um, and then. Uh, now I'm on Final Fantasy X, and then I, I find myself kind of like falling off. Other things have, have popped up. Um, Do you have a favorite of those? It's hard to say. It was really interesting. This is the first time I think I played these games with like a a more critical eye. Ah. Uh, and I found that I didn't enjoy them as much as I used to. Maybe it's because they're overplayed. But still, like Final Fantasy VI, I think is like a peak experience. Um, <sighs> Yeah, for me, followed closely by by seven. Um, if they did stuff a, about that, that just you know just resonates. It's such a beautiful story. I've been I, like, if they were to do, I know there's people begging and screaming for remakes of all of the Final Fantasy games at this point. But if they were to do like the seven treatment to six, I would die. I feel like that would be such God, a. I wonder. I wonder. I know if you could if you could voice a character in six if they did that. Uh, lock. Lock. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's such a good character, man. I love that game so much. Um, it's uh, again, all the Final Fantasies I think have done great storytelling, and I think that's they what do. attracted me as a kid. I, you know, yep. I, I became obsessed. Um, is there a game that came out recently for you that you were able to play that kind of had a similar effect like that within the last ten, fifteen years? Do, do, you know, you um, I mean, like. Last of Us was like a, an incredible experience. Sure. Like more recently than that, I played um, I played Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, oh yeah. And I did this thing like you know I have two kids. My when my uh, younger daughter goes to bed, it's pretty much like you know older kid and me time. Like that's just what we do. We just yeah. hang out until it's time for her to go to bed. And one of the things we've been doing for like the last year or so is like we're playing through single player games just like together. Like I'll play and she'll watch and, and commentate. She's ten. Yeah. Um. 
and uh, Ghost of Tsushima was like a little on like the violent side for what I'm usually, but like it, it wasn't that bad. She seemed to enjoy it, and like I can kind of talk through some of the more mature points. Um, and uh, that was a really, really cool experience. I had, uh, I, 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 I'll tell the story. Um, yeah. At the end of the, at the end of the game, and obviously, like if you haven't played Ghost of Tsushima, this is a, a spoiler. At the end of the game, uh, you know, you have Jean, who's the main character, and his uncle uh, are at odds because one of them is like very much, you know, beholden to the samurai order and like about honor and duty and justice. And Jean is now like an assassin who's like the ends justify the means kind of thing. And you're behind Jean's eye. And they have this incredible argument uh, at the end before you realize like you're going to have to kill your uncle, mm -hmm. uh, which is heartbreaking because he's basically like your adoptive father yeah and um they have this big argument and and you know the uncle says you have no honor and jin says and you're a slave to yours and like my daughter she like got quiet and she was like hey dad they're both right and i was like you get it you get it how beautiful it was awesome i was like you get it and you wouldn't have without that story yes. right like there's there's something so beautifully instructive and allegorical about stories and mm -hmm. what they can convey. And a light bulb went on for a 10 year old who went, ideals don't always go like this. Sometimes yeah. they go like this and they're both right. What do you do with that? <sighs> well, welcome to the rest of your life to try to figure it out. <laughs> but uh, it was such a great moment. And, and Ghost of Tsushima was like a really cool way to facilitate that. I, I, I mean, that's amazing. I'm sure that was probably the highlight of your it was great. Good, good week for something like that to happen. And uh, for someone who had been influenced in stories through video games in a similar way, I'm sure it was like, oh my gosh, it's so... And I think that's the thing about video games that people don't realize it can have that effect on mm -hmm. uh, through story. I mean, I didn't read... I, on, different to you, I didn't read a book when I was a kid. I couldn't, you know, I hated reading. It was like, but I, I wound up absorbing a bit of culture and understanding of complex grammar and language through playing certain video games and um i always i always wonder if people you know thankfully we're getting remakes of certain things of games that i thought were you know really great and stories i hope people will get to experience but i always fear that because games get outdated they won't get to experience uh some really great classic storytelling yeah. things or if new games because there's so much technology it will hinder certain aspects of the storytelling aspect um you know because the graphics it's like you're you know it's so crazy i always wonder if that will always trump the actual core of what i think makes a great game sometimes um, I think we've empirically seen that that's not the case. Uh, you know, like we've seen, I'm not, obviously I'm, I'm not going to name names because I work in this industry and I would like <laughs> working in this industry, but there yeah. are plenty of games that like, you know, you saw that were visually incredible and they were just hollow as a rotten log yeah. and nobody liked it, you know, like it, and all of a sudden that game is, well, that's $18 at GameStop after a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe yeah. tell a story next time, right? I, maybe I, maybe stop focusing on on the on how good it looks because that doesn't resonate with anybody, right? I hope that the studios or the ones that are making that content realize that because I mean, just through what we see through media and TV and film, while remakes are great, I think we as a society have become dependent. At least the industry, the film industry, has become dependent on uh, exploiting remakes and IPs that yes. have existed till the end of times because they know that they will guarantee some right. sort of return. Um, right. And to, to find these new stories that are uh, brand new stories that we've never seen before, we've never heard of before, we've never seen that dynamic with characters. I really hope we get to see more of those. Um, I agree with you completely. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's great. Um, again, Joe, I, I, I thank you for your time here so far. Yeah, of course. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, I would love to end this with uh, one question we usually ask our when I remember to do so of sure. our guests. Um, and it doesn't have to be related to the industry. Doesn't have to be related to anything we talked about. Um, but as the nature of the points of experience, is there an experience you've had in your life, whether professional or not professional, that had an impact on you or taught you a lesson or something that you feel sharing with people the experience of whatever it was um, that people listening might gain some benefit from or encouragement or uh, a lesson at the end of it that was really influential or impactful for you? The first thing that comes to your mind or the first one that maybe you've said a couple of times that really affects people? I tell this story... Um... Only because, and I don't think people will actually gain anything from it. It's just a weird story, right? I, I love it. 
Uh, so, you know, we talked about like me loving storytelling and always being attached to the idea of storytelling and, and playing games and reading books and watching movies and just being involved in the idea of stories, always loved mythology, um, and stuff like that. And, uh, when I was 16 years old, I was in a Walden books in a mall in New Jersey and I was browsing. I had just kind of like gotten into that, like, you know, teen phase where you're reading stuff about like metaphysics, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you're just like, oh, wow, maybe magic does exist, right? They're, they're, like you're just kind of at that cusp. Um, and I'm, I'm not even kidding you. I, like with no preamble whatsoever, this man who is very much in his late 70s, maybe early 80s, comes around the corner and without introducing himself says, young man, I have a book that will change your life. And I go, okay. And he reaches on the on the uh, uh, shelf and he pulls down a copy of Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth and hands it to me and walks away. I bought it on the spot, obviously, and it's now probably the book I have read or um, listened to the most in my entire life. Wow. It, it started me on this path of understanding stories for what they are, which is, like I said at the beginning, the currency of emotion. Like yeah. we exchange stories with each other as value. Mm -hmm. And we've been telling the same stories for tens of thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. They haven't changed because mm -hmm. the idea of like, what is this human thing hasn't changed either. Um, and boy, that just started me on this like path. I ended up, I was actually in a PhD for mythology for a, a hot minute. Um, because of, of that. And uh, Joseph Campbell and his works have been like pivotal to me coming to terms with being alive. Hero's journey. You know it's I mean? all just, yeah. I mean, if the, and it was something... all some random old man in a Walden books in a mall in New Jersey. <laughs> do you, do you believe that that was actually a human or was that some sort of I have no entity idea. from another universe that came to <laughs> honestly, whether it, it doesn't matter, the answer doesn't, to that matter. Question doesn't matter at all. <laughs> That is yeah. amazing. But again, I think the, the the takeaway from that is definitely look into Joseph Campbell's work as, as a well, storyteller. Well, yeah, there's that, 100%. Yeah, I think it's extremely influential. If you want to understand stories, then start start there. Yeah, amazing. Oh, wow, what a great story and what a great experience. Uh, congratulations to you, 16-year-old uh, you, for being... I know, right? Lucky me. <laughs> yeah, being graced with that. Uh, from one Garden State uh, fellow to another, thank you so much for coming on this podcast, Joe. Thanks for having me, uh, Before we go, I, we're going to tag everything in the description, but is there places specifically that people should be going or checking out or courses or social medias that you'd like to direct people yeah, to? Yeah, everything I've got is at learnvoiceacting.com. So everything I offer is there. The flagship is the Voice Acting Academy. That's your, you know, 30 hours, 100 and something lessons of content on basically the industry. But then there's also other things about online casting. There's, uh, you know, how to pitch yourself to agents. There's other smaller uh, offerings in there. And there's more as we go. But if you're really looking to get a foundation, for voice acting, learn voiceacting.com. The Voice Acting Academy is the course, um, super, super affordable. So awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, check that out. Stay tuned for more stuff with Joe. I, he's in persona right now, Risley and Genshin Impact. The list, I'm sure, is just going to keep going, 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 going. Let's so hope. thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on and for sharing all your insight. Uh, truly, I, I learned a lot, and uh, I think everybody else will too. Thanks, man. Awesome. Take care, buddy. There you have it, Joe Zija on the Points of Experience podcast. We are coming to you strong with back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back heavy hitters. Um, Joe, he just... I, I get the sense that he has just understood the way things work for him and, and, and how to become successful and how to make a business, how to be an entrepreneur, how to become successful at various different things. It seems like he's got that methodology that happens. Like I feel like he has figured a way within this industry that has such an enigmatic qualities to it to create formulas. Um which is so crazy. So uh, kudos to him, and make sure you guys check out his um, his academy. It's all going to be linked in here. I can't um, recommend that type of education within this industry enough. I found tremendous success through Voice One Two Three and Voices as well before I became confident enough to move to Los Angeles. So I 
I can definitely endorse the things that he is talking about. Thank you guys for being here again. Make sure you check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash points of experience or POX podcast, sorry, slash POX podcast. Um, and you can also subscribe on Spotify, another way for you to get access to um, behind the scenes, the Discord server, and exclusive episodes that are only going to be available to people who are subscribing to Spotify and Patreon. Appreciate you guys being here. If there's a guest you'd like us to have, you can email us. If you got questions, all that good stuff. We just truly appreciate you being here. Um, and again, Joe with another phenomenal episode. Uh, make sure you go and uh, play Fire Emblem Three Houses if you haven't. He's in Persona Three Reload, um, and many, 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 many more. All right, guys, have a wonderful day, uh, and we'll see you on the next. One.